Hi, I'm Sarah Tishkoff. I'm a professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the Departments of Biology and Genetics. And today I'm going to tell you about my research on African integrative genomics and implications for human origins and disease. So in part one, I'm going to tell you a bit about human evolutionary history and what the implications are of that on the patterns of genomic variation that we see in populations today. So I want to start by talking about some of the key challenges in human genomics research. And the first one is to characterize the immense array of genomic and phenotypic diversity across ethnically diverse human populations. Secondly, to understand what the evolutionary processes are that are generating and maintaining that variation. And third, to better understand how gene-gene, gene-protein, and gene-environment interactions contribute to phenotypic variability. So first, let's start with the um, evolutionary history of the hominin lineage that's leading to modern humans, um, and which begins around the time that we diverge from our closest genetic relative, the chimpanzee, sometime between five to seven million years ago. So shown here are some of the fossils from the different um, species preceding anatomically modern humans. In blue are shown fossils from the old, oldest lineages. Um, and in fact, one of the oldest is Sahelanthropus, which has been dated to at least seven million years ago. And there's some debate about whether it even belongs on the hominid lineage or if it actually preceded the chimpanzee and human divergence. After that, in green, we see the Australopithecus genus. In yellow, we see Paranthropus genus. In orange, we have the genus Homo, and the um, species preceding anatomically modern humans is Homo erectus, dated to about two million years ago. And then we have the origins of, the, of Homo neanderthalensis and of anatomically modern humans. Uh, ne Neanderthals are thought to have originated somewhere between 300,000 to 400,000 years ago, and modern humans originated approximately 200,000 years ago. Here is one of the best examples of Australopithecus afarensis. Um, this was a set of fossils that was discovered in the 70s by Johansson and Gray, um, named Lucy. And Lucy was uh, about 3.2, she lived about 3.2 million years ago. She was very small, only about three feet tall. She had a very small brain. And she was bipedal. And being bipedal, in fact, is one of the characteristics of the hominin lineage. And interestingly, um, there have been some fossilized footprints identified in Tanzania. And we can see from these that there appears to have been um, a mother from the uh, species Australopithecus afarensis, and she was holding the hands of her child. And they must have been walking in ash from um, recent volcanic activity. And then that ash hardened and preserved these footprints so that we can see them today. And we can clearly see that they were bipedal. So the species preceding modern humans is called Homo erectus. Homo erectus evolved around two million years ago. And then after uh, the origin of Homo erectus in Africa, um, Homo erectus spread across Eurasia. And indeed, shown here are some of the oldest fossils of Homo erectus, dated to as early as 1.9 million years ago in Indonesia. And this species was very successful, lasting to as recently as 25,000 years ago in Southeast Asia. A very interesting recent finding was um, a set of fossils identified on the island of Flores, um, which is within Indonesia. And these fossils actually show some characteristics that look very similar to Homo erectus. And for that reason, it was proposed that this species may have uh, directly um, evolved from a Homo erectus ancestor that um, arrived on that island about one million years ago and then evolved in isolation. And two of the very unique features of the species is that they were very short. So again, about the same size as Lucy, around um, three feet tall. And secondly, that they had tiny brains. And there's been a lot of debate about whether this is an adaptation or, in fact, a pathology. And there's still a lot of be research being done. But what was clear is that there were multiple species 
outside of Africa within the past two million years. So now let's move on to the origins of Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens. There's some question about the species um, preceding Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Some say that it was Heidelbergensis, but there's debate about that. However, what is clear is that the uh, Neanderthal species arose somewhere within the past 300,000 to 400,000 years, and Homo sapiens arose within the past 200,000 years. And this is a fossil from Neanderthal. We can see a few features, such as the um, double arched and very wide brow ridges, a broad nose, a very large brain size, and a retromolar space. And in fact, these species were very robust. Um, the males would have been over six feet tall. They had very big bones, and they had rather big brains. In fact, here are some uh, reconstructions of Neanderthal. We have the uh, old reconstruction and then the more recent one as well. So anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, arose approximately 200,000 years ago. In fact, here, these red dots are representing locations where fossils have been found of anatomically modern humans. And the oldest fossil is dated to around 150 to 195,000 years ago in southern Ethiopia. We also see evidence of early modern human behavior dated to 70,000 years ago or even as old as 120,000 years ago in caves in South Africa and also some from uh, East Africa as well. So after modern humans arose in Africa within the past 200,000 years, one or a few small groups of individuals migrated um, across the rest of the globe within the past 50,000 to 100,000 years. Indeed, we think that um, Europeans, there were no people in Europe, actually, until about 40,000 years ago. And then um, modern humans crossed the Bering Straits and went into the Americas within the past 30,000 years. The earliest migration event was actually into Australia, Melanesia, dated to about 40 to 60,000 years ago. And then we have much more recent um, migration events, such as into the Pacific Islands within the past few thousand years. Now, Interestingly, when modern humans migrated out of Africa within the past 50 to 100,000 years, they would have run into Neanderthals. In fact, they overlapped in their distribution. So shown here is the distribution of Neanderthals. And the modern humans who lived at that time were referred to as Cro-Magnon. And in fact, we did not see anatomically modern humans in this region, in Europe, until about 40,000 years ago. They would have been in the Middle East a little bit earlier. But it appears that they overlapped for about at least 10,000 years with Neanderthals. And as we'll discuss later, there is some evidence that there could have been actual admixture between Neanderthal and anatomically modern humans during that time. So now I want to discuss the evolutionary forces that influence the patterns of genetic variation that we see today. And these include mutation, genetic drift, migration, and natural selection. So let's first introduce some terminology. The gene pool refers to the set of all genomes in a specified population. And here we have an example from a population of warthogs. So here we have at a single a genetic locus, two alleles, big B or little b. And here's an example of an individual who is homozygous for the big B allele, and an individual homozygous for the little b allele, and here's an individual who is heterozygous for big B and little b. And together, the set of alleles in that population represents the gene pool. So when we are doing population genetics analyses, we can't actually go out and look at every um, genotype for every individual in a population. That would be unfeasible. So what we typically do is to infer frequencies um, by estimating them from a random sample. So in population genetics, each generation, um, each new individual is viewed as drawing from a set of gametes with alternative alleles. So let's use an example here in which we have a set of marbles in a bowl. And initially, we have um, a distribution of um, 60 of the white marbles relative to 40 of the green marbles. And these, the white and the green are representing different alleles. So let's say that we're going to pick, we're going to reach into this bag, 
and we're going to randomly draw out another 100 of these um, marbles. And now in the next generation, we have 80 of the white and we have 20 of the green. We're going to reach back in. We're going to grab another set of 100. And now in the next generation, we have um, 100 of the white alleles and zero of the green. And this is a demonstration of how we get changes in allele frequency over time. Allele frequencies will also change over time due to genetic drift, which is defined as random fluctuations of allele frequencies from generation to generation, simply due to chance. So as we see, sometimes things can happen, like these bugs are getting squashed, and that's going to change the, um, perhaps the allele frequency in the next generation. Here's another example from some ladybugs, and we can see that um, perhaps in the next generation, just by chance, we're going to see more of these ladybugs with the dark colors, or we might see more that are with the medium colors and dots. And the fact is that drift is just an inevitable fact of life. I also want to uh, define what we mean by neutral evolution. So we define a selectively neutral allele as one that does not affect the reproductive fitness of individuals who carry that allele. So its frequency in the population changes by chance or genetic drift alone. And here we have an example. This is just um, a substitution in the third position of the codon. And when we have substitutions in the, of nucleotides in the third position, very typically they result in a silent or synonymous change. So here there's been a substitution, but there's no change in the amino acid. It remains as valine. So the rate at which genetic drift occurs is going to be inversely proportional to the population size n, and it's going to be very fast in small populations. And here's an example that we can look at based on computer simulation. So let's assume here that we have, we're looking at a single locus, and it has two alleles that are at 50% frequency each, as we can see here. We have a sample size of 25, and we're going to do the simulation over 80 generations. Now, each of these lines here represents a different simulation. And what we can see is that over time, alleles are either going to um, be lost from the population, or they're going to reach fixation, which means that they go to 100% frequency. And the rate at which this occurs is going to depend on the sample size. So in a small sample, it's going to be very rapid. But in this example where we have a larger sample, now n equals 300, you could see that it just takes more time. There's not as much genetic drift occurring. Now the end result is going to be the same, it just takes more time. Um, the change in allele frequency also is going to depend on the initial allele frequency. So in this particular case, we've now changed the starting frequency. It's not 50%, it's now 10%. And you can see that there's much more um, probability of loss of the allele in this case. And one, here we have just one of the alleles um, reaching fixation. So again, in this particular case, about 1 out of 10 um, will eventually become fixed or reach 100% frequency. Now here's an example from a large population. It'll take longer for this to occur, but the proportion of the alleles are going to be roughly the same. So again, roughly 1 out of 10 will go to fixation. It's just going to take longer. Other important terms in population genetics are bottleneck and founder effects. And this is because genetic drift has a large effect on allele frequencies when a population originates via a small number of people from a larger population. So here we have an example of a bottleneck. And what a bottleneck means is that there's been a decrease in population size at some time in the past. So you could think of it as a population crash. And what happens when the population is very small you're going to have a higher rate of genetic drift. And we can see here that these alleles, which are represented by the different colors, have shifted from what we're seeing back at this uh, earlier time. Now we go through the bottleneck, and now we're seeing predominantly these white and black alleles. Another example we can look at is a founder event, which is sort of a special case of a bottleneck event. 
And then in this case, it's where a population, a small population, breaks off from the larger population. And again, there's going to be increased genetic drift in this initially small population. And here, by chance, we just happen to see more of these dark blue and um, light blue alleles. The pattern of variation that we see in the human genome is also dependent on the effect of population size, which we um, distinguish as capital N sub E. And the definition of the effect of population size is the number of breeding individuals in a population. So estimates of NE are most strongly influenced by population sizes when they're at their smallest. And it could take many generations to recover from a bottleneck event. So estimates of NE in modern populations reflect the size of the population prior to population expansion. Pretty consistently, studies of nuclear sequence diversity in humans have estimated an effective population size of about 10,000. Now, by contrast, if we look at chimpanzees, the estimate is closer to 35,000. And so what that means is that humans have undergone a bottleneck sometime during their evolutionary history. So the pattern of genomic variation that we see in modern populations today is a reflection of our evolutionary and demographic history. So how much do we differ? Well, identical twins differ, have no differences at the nucleotide level. If we compare unrelated humans, we differ at about one out of a thousand nucleotide sites. And if we compare humans to our closest genetic relative, the chimpanzee, we differ at about one out of a hundred sites. So as a whole, our species is very similar, and that simply reflects our recent common ancestry from Africa within the past 100,000 years. But when you consider that there are over 3 billion DNA bases in the genome, that results in 3 million differences between each pair of genomes, more than enough to generate the diversity um, that will make each of us unique. Now I want to introduce a statistic that we typically use to look at how much variation there is among populations. And this is referred to as an FST statistic. And it's simply looking at the proportion of genetic variation that is within populations relative to that which is between populations. FST can be measured based on um, heterozygosity. And heterozygosity is simply a measure of genetic variation, which is very simply calculated as 1 minus the sum of the allele frequencies squared. And so once we calculate um, the heterozygosity for each locus, we can look at the average, and we can look at the average within a subpopulation or in the total combined population. Now, just as an example, if we were to see here that um, in the case of FST equals 1, it means that there is no overlap at all in the allele frequency. So we can see that in population 1, they have all A's, and in population 2, they have all B's. And in the case of FST equals 0, um, there is a complete similarity. So here we see exactly the same number of A alleles and exactly the same number of B alleles. And then here's an intermediate case where we have a value of about 11 0.11, 11%, showing that um, there's just a small amount of differentiation between these two populations. So what do we see in humans? Well, the average FST between human populations is about 15%. And what that means is that the majority of genetic variation is, is found within a population, and only about 15% of the genetic diversity differs between populations. Again, this is reflecting our recent common ancestry in Africa within the past 50 to 100,000 years. Now, interestingly, if we were to do this calculation for chimpanzee populations, we see that the value is around 32 percent. So there's actually a lot more differentiation among chimpanzee populations than among human populations, again, reflecting our overall close genetic similarity to each other. So I now want to talk about the different sources of DNA that we use to reconstruct human evolutionary history. One source of DNA is that which is present in the nuclear genome that's located in the nucleus of the cell. And there's another type of genome which is present in the mitochondria of the cell. And the mitochondria is the energy-producing organelle. 
So what is the difference between these different genomes? Well, the uh, nuclear genome consists of 22 autosomal pairs of chromosomes, and then the sex chromosomes, XX for females and XY for males. The nuclear genome is about 3.4 billion bases in size, and it consists of about 20,000 coding genes. It's inherited from both parents, but it also undergoes extensive recombination each generation. But one of the reasons it's useful is that there's so many different locations where we can study variation, given that there are 3 billion nucleotides. It's just a little bit more difficult to trace them back to a single common ancestor. By contrast, the mitochondrial DNA genome is very small. It's only about 16,000 nucleotides in size, and it's circular, and it's passed on only through the maternal lineage. There's also no recombination, and it has a very high mutation rate. All of these features make it very useful for tracing evolutionary history. So let me give you another example of what I'm referring to. The mitochondrial DNA is inherited through the maternal lineage, whereas the nuclear DNA is inherited from both parents. So if we were to trace back from a present-day individual, they will have inherited their nuclear genome from their parents. Their parents would have inherited from their set of parents, and then their set of parents, and so on. So we can trace it back to a large number of ancestors. But by contrast, if we're tracing back mitochondrial DNA lineages, we can see that they're only passed on through the maternal lineage. So they're essentially inherited from a single lineage. We can trace them back to a single common female ancestor. And that's why they've been very useful for human evolutionary genetic studies. So, for example, if we were to consider these um, dots to be mitochondrial DNA lineages, and let's start at generation 11 at the bottom, shown by the red dots. And imagine those are different mitochondrial DNA sequences from different individuals. At some time in the past, these two um, individuals, for example, coalesce back to a common ancestor. And then this group coalesces back to a common ancestor here. And ultimately, they all coalesce back to a single common ancestor. Now, in the popular literature, the single common ancestor for mitochondrial DNA is often referred to as mitochondrial Eve. But one thing to remember is that Eve was not alone. She lived within a population, as we can see here by the other colors. But those lineages just never made it down to the, to the present day. So this is a phylogenetic tree constructed by sequencing mitochondrial DNA whole genome lineages from ethnically diverse individuals. So each individual actually represents a branch on this tree. And if two individuals are very closely related to each other, they'll be very close to each other um, in the tree. So one of the first things you can see using chimpanzee as an outgroup is that all modern human lineages coalesce at about 170,000 years ago. And so that corresponds very well with the time of origin of anatomically modern humans. So another thing that we can see is that all of the oldest genetic lineages are from African individuals. We can also see that the um, very oldest lineages are from the San and the Mabuti Pygmy hunter-gatherers. And then the more recent lineages are from non-African populations. And that is a, a pattern that's very consistent with a model of a recent African origin of modern humans. Now, another way that we can compare mitochondrial DNA sequences is to simply count up the number of sites at which they differ when we compare any pair of sequences. And when we do this, we observe that um, African, any two African lineages will differ from each other at many more sites than any two non-African lineages. And again, that means that there has been more time for variation to accumulate in Africa and is consistent with an African origin of modern humans. When we sequence the mitochondrial DNA lineages, we can classify them as haplotypes, and those haplotypes belong to larger subsets of haplogroups. And you can think of it, a haplotype as simply the arrangement of genetic variants along a chromosome. Or in the case of the mitochondrial DNA, there's just a single genome. So it's really just the different um, nucleotide 
differences amongst different mitochondrial DNA lineages. And one of the first things that you can note is that there are different haplogroups in different regions of the world. So here are some that seem to be pretty specific to Africa, um, but are also present in some regions where there may have been some gene flow from Africa. Then we have others that may be more common in Europe um, or in East Asia or in the Americas. And for that reason, um, mitochondrial DNA can be very useful for tracing recent uh, human migration events. Now, by contrast, the Y chromosome is also um, inherited with no recombination. And so it can also be very useful for tracing back through the male lineages. And here is a phylogeny constructed from Y chromosome variation. And as with the mitochondrial DNA, what we see is that the oldest lineages are specific to Africans. And the more recent lineages are found predominantly in non-Africans, although we do see some in Africans as well. Again, this is consistent with the recent African origin of modern humans. We can also look at why chromosome haplogroups. And one of the things that's a little bit different is you can see that they're a bit more differentiated between geographic regions. So, for example, here we just see um, haplogroups that are in blue, and we see very distinct haplogroups in the Americas shown in purple. And one of the reasons for that may have to do with um, sex bias migration, that you may have, for example, one male traveling long distances, and it may also have to do with mating patterns of um, mating structure. So, for example, in some populations or ethnic groups, you may have one male who has many different wives. And because of that, the effect of, so the effect of population size of the Y chromosome is actually smaller than the mitochondrial DNA, and we tend to get more genetic differentiation around the world. So now I want to talk about analyses of ancient DNA, for example, um, in this case, from Neanderthal. And this is, these are some images of scientists um, working on a Neanderthal fossil. And this type of analysis is very challenging for a number of reasons. One is that um, DNA, that, which is that old, on the order of, say, 30,000 years old to even 100,000 years old, is going to be highly degraded. And if there's any contamination with modern human DNA, that is much more likely to amplify than the old degraded DNA from the um, archaic species. So one has to be extremely careful when analyzing this DNA. Now, more recently, there was a pinky finger bone identified in a cave in Siberia um, from a region called Denisova. So it's called, um, referred to as the Denisova or Denisovan genome. Here I'm presenting a phylogenetic tree based on mitochondrial DNA variation, comparing modern humans, shown in blue here, to Neanderthals, shown in red, and the Denisova individual, shown in yellow. And what we can see is that the time to most recent common ancestry in humans, as we've already discussed, is about 200,000 years ago. The time to most recent common ancestry um, between humans and Neanderthals is about 500,000 years ago for the mitochondrial DNA lineages. And the time to most recent common ancestry um, with the Denisova mitochondrial DNA lineages is about 1 million years ago. So this is demonstrating a couple of things. From the mitochondrial DNA perspective, there's no evidence of any admixture with um, anatomically modern humans. The Neanderthal sequences are clearly very distinct from modern humans. It's also showing you that there was another species, Denisova, that appears to be distinct from the Neanderthals, and they diverge even earlier than Neanderthals from modern humans. So if we were to compare pairwise nucleotide diversity, um, for example, among anatomically modern humans, shown in blue, you can see that there's not a lot of diversity, as expected, considering that we all have a very recent common ancestry. If you compare the modern human mitochondrial DNA genomes to Neanderthal, you can see that they're more divergent, as expected, given that the lineage, uh, mitochondrial DNA lineage diverged about 500,000 years ago. If we compare to the Denisovan 
mitochondrial DNA lineage, they're even more divergent. And then if we compare to chimpanzee, of course, as expected, given that they diverged at least 5 million years ago, they are the most different in terms of um, sequence variation. Now, um, several years ago, there was um, a draft sequence produced of the Neanderthal genome using next-generation sequencing technology. And this was an absolutely amazing feat. But at the time, they had very low coverage, meaning that any particular region of the genome was sequenced only about once or twice. Now, more recently, as the technology has improved, they've gotten much better coverage of the Neanderthal sequence. And quite recently, they now have a 30-fold coverage, meaning that on average, most sites will have been sequenced 30 times. And so, you'll have a much better um, accuracy when determining, determining nucleotide variation. So, when the Neanderthal genome was compared to the human genome, what you can do is first look at how much divergence has occurred since modern humans uh, differentiated from chimpanzees within the past 6.5 million years. And you can look at the divergence that has occurred specifically in the human lineage since they diverged from Neanderthal. And they've only accumulated about 8 percent of this total divergence. And so, the estimate at the time of population divergence between humans and Neanderthals is about 400,000 years ago. Furthermore, it has been estimated that there may have been a small amount of admixture between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, as shown by this red arrow here. So, the um, estimated amount of admixture is about 1 to 2 percent of the modern human genome may be of Neanderthal ancestry. But what is of interest is to note that this is only present in non-Africans. It is not present in African genomes. And so, what we can infer from that is that this admixture event probably occurred before modern humans spread across the globe. It may have occurred, for example, in the Middle East. Um, and that's why we're seeing it in, present in all non-Africans. And we don't see it at all in Africans. Now, more recently, there has been um, whole genome sequencing of the Denisovan individual. And what that has shown is that the Denisovan species, or this individual, appears to have diverged from modern-day humans around 800,000 years ago, consistent with what we saw from the mitochondrial DNA. They also observed low levels of heterozygosity in Denisova, suggesting that they may have had a small population size. Additionally, um, when a phylogenetic tree was constructed from the nuclear DNA variation, they could see that the, the modern humans tend to cluster together, and as we expect, they're divergent from the Denisova and the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals tend to cluster together, so they're clearly divergent from Denisova. But what's interesting is if you look at how much, um, how much variation there is amongst the modern humans, as indicated by the length of these lineages, and then you compare that to Neanderthals, which have very short branches, what that suggests is that there was not a lot of genetic variation amongst the Neanderthals. And therefore, they may have undergone a bottleneck. So, they might have undergone a population crash at some point in the past. So, in summary, um, what we can see is that Homo erectus left Africa within the past 2 million years and spread throughout Eurasia, giving rise possibly to species like Homo florensiensis, and surviving until quite recently as recently as around 25,000 years ago. Then we have um, other species like Neanderthal and Denisovans, who may have originated from a different um, species, such as Heidelbergensis. And they differentiated sometime around six or 700,000 years ago in the case of Denisova or Neanderthals around 400,000 years ago. And then we have the modern human lineage, um, Homo sapiens, which arose around 200,000 years ago and spread out of Africa. But when they did so, they would have encountered these other species. And there may have then been 
low levels of gene flow. In fact, for the case of the Denisovan genome, it appears that the gene flow was predominantly with populations from Oceania. Um, implying that this admixture may have occurred in a different location and a different time. Now, we still don't know exactly how much admixture there may have been between archaic species um, and modern humans in Africa, but there's some preliminary data suggesting that this has occurred there as well. The problem is that the fossils don't preserve as well in Africa, so we don't have any DNA sequences from archaic lineages in Africa at this point. So, in conclusion, Africa has the most genetic diversity in the world. Human dispersions out of Africa populated the entire world, and we are the last of a series of hominin dispersal events out of Africa.